Good morning. What's going on there? Oh, I'm stupid. It's just coming through twice. Start over. Good morning. How's everyone doing? Welcome to the morning show. My name is Jimmy. Nickname, John Boy Company name, John Boy Media. Good, happy Friday. Hope everyone's excited for the weekend. We're getting a dog today, so we're pretty excited. Uh, this show, if you've never listened to before, is a combination of all of my interests in uh, life. Music, Langhorn Slim, love Langhorn Slim, so good live. Music, books, baseball, American towns, American history, American geography. Um, so what's going on? We got Ben in the in the chat, Abe's here as usual, Patty, glove man, Shermanator. Never seen him around, Wisconsin sports fan. What's going on on Facebook? Uh, we got Morning from the UK with Stuart. Love it. Abraham, Dan Savitsky, and um, Periscope, not Mr. Moon. What up, dude? And Mike. So what's going on, everyone? How you doing? Happy Friday. Like I said, we're getting a dog today, so we're kind of excited. Big day. And uh, let's, get, uh, let's get right into it. We got, uh, it's kind of uh, an interesting one. Let's see. Coming up on John Boy Media Network, Talking Baseball Today is a conversation we had with Taylor Hearn of the Texas Rangers, black pitcher in baseball. So we talked a lot of baseball, a lot of pitching strategy, a lot of his draft story. We also talked about, you know, how come there's not a lot of black players playing baseball anymore? How did he get into it? Also, his history, his family's history of being rodeo clowns. That was a fun conversation. Pretty good. Uh, Talking Yanks, we had the Pinstripe Strong crew on we did a little crossover episode talk about the bronx and yankee stadium and the police at the bronx and the police at the yankee stadium and the culture in the bronx and the culture in yankee stadium and all that talking giants i'm not sure if they released an episode very very sad and tragic news from talking giants family um a contributor for them passed away suddenly so uh a heartbreaking heartbreaking update and i feel and I don't even know, man. I feel and uh, hopefully I don't think there's anything I can do, but I can offer everything so uh, that I can do uh, for the Talking Giants community. Um, so if you listen to that show, if you if you know Bobby, if you know Justin, reach out. I'm sure they could use some kind words. It's a crazy time. What we're listening to on the folk scene, they did uh, like, uh, you know, their favorite uh, black musicians and a little history of black music with some lead belly. Which I fucking love lead belly. It's the original singer of Good Night Irene. Irene, good night. There's a video of uh, Jack White. Jack White singing Good Night Irene. Jack White. Good night. There's a video of Jack White singing Good Night Irene at Newport Folk Festival. And he just cries. I mean, I don't, I don't know why I'm laughing. It's cool. He, he cries in the middle of it. I don't know if I'll be able to find it for you guys. Um, but the lyrics were like, stop gambling. Stop. How's, go home to your wife and your children by the fireside. Right? What's the lyrics to Good Night, Irene? Do you guys know? <clears throat> stop rambling. Stop gambling. Quit staying out late at night. Go home to your wife and your family. Sit down by the fireside bright. Jack White just cries his eyes out at Newport Folk Festival while singing that. It's pretty cool. Uh, but it's a Lead Belly song. Lead Belly's awesome. John Boy and Jake TV, we watched an episode of Supermarket Sweep. Love Supermarket Sweep. And watching baseball, I think it's a 2016... Something? I don't know. Anyway, that's everything that's coming out on the John Boy Media Network today. The random town of the day is Thibodeau, Louisiana. And I'll be honest with you guys. This was as random as every other town. Producer Luke just chooses a town. And then we go down the rabbit hole. 
go to YouTube, go to Wikipedia, go to news articles, go to history sites, and go down the rabbit hole. So this is very appropriate, but very random. Some of you will probably feel uncomfortable listening to this. Some of you will probably turn it off. But if you turn it off, if you listen to every other morning episode, but you turn this one off, I mean, that's kind of the problem we're facing right now. So Thibodeau, Louisiana has a shitty fucking history. The French came to Thibodeau because it's, uh, you know, it's in Louisiana. It's Cajun territory. The French come there because the Cajuns are excommunicated everywhere else. They come to Thibodeau, Louisiana, and the first thing they do is import slaves from Africa. Very first thing they do, and they set up plantations like this. You see all these fields? This is an old plantation, right? You see all this? If we zoom in here on the little area, those are the slave chambers. Still still around uh, in Thibodeau. I think they even make tours out of them and call it the history of our culture. Um, which I don't know what the fuck that is, but like, look at this. So, terrible history. So, in the Civil War, the Union troops take over Thibodeau, and after the war, they free all the slaves, and they say, you got to pay these guys salaries. And it was sugarcane plantations, not cotton, which, um, from what I read, takes more skill. And, you know, they actually had a bit more to stand on the sugarcane uh, workers because it took more skill than the cotton where they were easily replaceable and they were all that shit. So they're getting paid after the war. All the people have to pay them and they're laborers and they're getting paid. And then a couple years later, the Jim Crow laws go into effect and the white knights come into effect. And if you don't know what the white knights are, the white knights are basically, uh, they're allies of the KKK, basically a different version of the KKK. And, you know, they would vote on a bill to pass that would fuck over the black people of the area. And then the white knights, the white league, sorry, the white league would just beat the shit out of any black person that tried to vote and make them not able to vote. Therefore, all the laws that fucked over the black community and the black laborers passed. That's how Jim Crow happened. Um, then all of the sugar producers, they, they formed an association, 200 major planters in the area, and they said, hey, let's uh, make sure that no one's paying more than this. We won't pay more than this so our workers can't leave and go find better pay anywhere else. They also... The most fucked up thing, and if uh, anyone, uh, you know, tries to tell you systematic racism is a part of this country, and you hear that, and you don't fully know what it means, and you've never listened to it before, the the Sugarcane Plantation Association all agreed that they would not pay the laborers, the black laborers, in money. They would pay them in script which was basically just gift cards to the local store on the plantation. So they couldn't save up and become wealthy. All they could do was trade in their wage for food and drinks and livelihood needed stuff from the local store in that town. So their money wasn't good two miles away. So... um that's the systematic racism and the, you just keep them down. But if you can believe it, it gets worse because the black laborers decide, hey, you know, we have a skill. Let's fucking go on strike. So they do that. And the plantation, not the plantation owners at this point. Well, yeah, but they're laborers. So I guess it's still plantation. They do that. And the, um, the plantation orders call in the government and say, hey, our workers are going on strike. 10,000 black laborers went on strike and 1,000 whites joined them. And they called in the government and said, we need help. Our workers are going on strike, a peaceful strike. And they, the government came in and they beat the fuck out of them and they killed them. And they killed about 60 
people and they uh, barricaded Thibodeau so they couldn't leave because that's where they were, uh, you know, on strike and kind of just hanging out and staying. And uh, it's called the Thibodeau Massacre. And that's the systematic racism of the system. That wasn't just your everyday neighbor being rude to neighbor. It was the government and the workers fucking over the, the uh, disenfranchising black people. They killed like 60 people. A ton more went missing. It's a crazy story. It's absolutely heartbreaking. It's terrible. And, um, but check this out. If you want to go to Thibodeau, uh, you can go check out this shit and listen to how they describe it on their official government video. There's also plenty of sightseeing, from trips into our exotic natural world to tours of colorful history. The area's historically significant plantations include Rienzi, Acadia, Ordon, O'Galley, Laura, Maidwood, and a preserve of plantation life at Laurel Valley. So yeah, if you want to go check out our color, colorful history, Come on down. You can see, uh, you know, just a preserve of plantation life and all the rich fucking mansions. Come pay your money and come look at how fucked up we used to be. It's crazy, man. Absolutely crazy. So that was the random town of the day. We didn't go fishing for it uh, and say like, hey, this is what we want to talk about. But no, I mean, I didn't know that much about the Thibodeau Massacre. So crazy. But we'll move on to the player. That's all I had to say about that. Who is fun? See, some guy in the chat says, random player of the day, please stop talking about this. Stop talking about this. Yeah. That's the problem. Joaquin, Joaquin Andujar. This dude is a goddamn character. Joaquin Andujar was a pitcher for the Cardinals. He has a really, really good World Series appearance. He has a really, really bad World Series appearance. Let's do uh, his. Um, let's do his baseball reference. Long career. Thirteen years, and I tweeted out his warm up pitch last night because I was just watching videos, doing my rabbit hole research. And look, he led the league in wins one year with twenty. That's cool. Bad year, 1984 for pitchers. He won 21 the next year. Career ERA of 3.58. That's pretty good if you pitched in uh, as many games as he did. That's pretty good. 405 games and an ERA under four. That's impressive, especially on the AstroTurf cookie-cutter fields he was playing on. But he uh, in 1982, game logs, postseason. In 1982... He was awesome in the World Series. He pitched in game seven. They got the win, seven innings pitched, two earned runs, just a great performance. Uh, in, in game three of the World Series, 6.1. Dude had a lot of swagger on the mound, pitched with confidence and fun, wore some tight-ass pants, chain. Uh, and then the next World Series is in 1985, which is the video we're going to play soon. Pretty bad. Six earned runs, four innings pitch, four earned runs. Then we'll watch game seven. They're already down, and they brought him in uh, just to fuck with the ump. It's crazy. Someone, let me see if I could pull up my the him doing his warm-up because it's awesome. I, made a, I just made a gif of it, so it'll play. It's the last throw down. So he starts off in deep thought. Then he fist pumps to himself, and then he throws the ball from glove to hand, bobbles it a couple times, goes throwing a fastball, windmill, windmill, throw. <laughs> Here we go. Fist pump, ball to, ball to hand, bounce, 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 windmill, 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 throw. Just a hell of a warm-up by our guy. Here's, here's the, the one I put in the title. So he comes into this World Series game, and it's 10 to nothing, Cardinals are losing, and it's game seven. And this ump behind the dish is the same ump that made a horrible call in game six of the World Series. So they're not really happy with him. 
Andujar comes in, and he doesn't like the call on this pitch. He asks the umpire, is that outside? Um says, yeah, that was outside. He says, okay, I'll live with that. No one's having fun. Cardinals are about to lose the World Series, and they it's only the fifth inning, so it's going to drag on. Next pitch he throws, I think he tries to get that spot again. Oh, no, foul ball, so I'll skip ahead. Step off, Jim Sundberg up. So he wants that pitch, or no, he's just getting frustrated. Where, where am I? All right, all right, here we go. There's two in a row he gets so mad at. And not that one either, Jimmy, dumb fuck. It's this one that he gets mad at, but they have the behind the screen shot. So it's not called a strike. You can see him yelling at the ump. Ump's looking away from him. He goes, at this point, he says right here, he goes, that's a fucking strike. That's a fucking strike. Fuck you. It's a fucking strike. Fuck you. That's what he's saying there. Ump runs right out, gets in his face. You do not see this anymore. I mean, we think umps are bad. That ump ran right out, got right in his face. And this goes on for a while. Like, he's yelling and screaming. The manager yells and screams. They're losing the World Series. They're down 10 nothing in the fifth inning of Game 7. They're mad. It happens again. They keep breaking it up. They keep breaking it up. I don't want, if I did a breakdown on this, maybe I'd try to find out what they're saying. But he stays in the game. Here's the pitch. Let's see if we can. I mean, that looks pretty good. If that, yeah, I think this one is a strike. Because it's probably behind the runner on this shot. I think that probably crossed the plate. Especially back then when the strike zone was wide and not tall. The very next pitch, obviously he's going to throw the same pitch. Obviously the ump's not going to give him the call. All right, here we go. This is the next pitch of this at bat. Right after that whole melee where the manager got thrown out. 3-2 now. And he wants it again. And watch this. He charges the ump. That's horse shit. That's fucking horse shit. And bumps him. He didn't do anything. Well, I mean, he got fined. Apparently, after this, Andujar went to the clubhouse and took a bat to the sink of the Royals visiting clubhouse and just beat the sink to shit. Look how mad he is. I mean, it's the end of the season anyway. You're going to lose the World Series anyway. So just get it all out, I guess. I hope they show a replay. I think that pitch wasn't a strike. I think the one before was a strike. So he's angry. And he's expecting a makeup call. Or no, he just wants a strike. We got to restrain him the whole way out. A lot of people said on the Twitter that they used to call him uh, walking underwear. Because Joaquin, Joaquin Andujar. Which I don't know if that's fun or messed up. But, you know. Johnny, Johnny Luizaga gets called Johnny Lasagna by Yankee teammates and fans. Is that the same thing? Let's see this pitch. That's behind the plate at that point, I think. Super slow-mo. Love it. Playback speed. Super slow. And looks like a two-seam fastball. Here we go. You got to remember the strike zone was much wider back then than it is now. So is that where it's crossing the plate? Is there out in front of the plate? I always look at the, the batter's feet and hips to try and tell when it's crossing the plate. Like, if anything, I think that's over the plate. And we have a weird angle on it. I don't know. It's a close pitch. It tails a lot because it's a two-seamer. So at the very end, he catches it off the plate. That's for sure. But I don't know where it crossed. But I wonder if he's the last player to get kicked out of a World Series game. I wonder how many players have been ejected from Game 7 of the World Series before. There can't be that many, right? Game 7, World Series ejections. Getting ejected from the World Series hasn't always taken... A lot of screaming. Okay. Fangraphs article. And. Yeah, 
Here it is. The first occurred in 1907 when Tigers manager Huey Jennings was shooed away by the umpire for back talk regarding a play at second. So 1907, almost don't care about that. Um, last night's measurement of base running decorum was at first was two old friends catching up over coffee compared to the kerfuffle Joe Medwick started in 1934 World Series in a deeply uninteresting game seven. So similar situation to 1985 Medwick's Cardinals Cardinals again were up on the Tigers eight nothing. They're winning, not losing this time when the left fielder tripled in a ninth run as he slid into third, a brief Kicking skirmish broke out between the still horizontal Medwick and the notable upright Detroit third baseman, Marv Owen. The kicks graduated into torso blows, and eventually the two men were both up on their feet, attempting to settle the matter via baseball times honored slap fight. Okay, you're getting too cute with me, getting too cute. So they fought. Mickey Cochran came out to plead, and he got. These are all old. 1934. You can't. 1934. So 2019, 1934, 1985. Very, very rare. And that sucks. I played in the state championship game in the hockey, ice hockey. And one of my teammates got ejected on the opening faceoff. Before they dropped the puck, him and the other uh, wing started just like, you know, knocking each other and shit talking. And he got ejected before they even dropped it. It's crazy. All right. Andujar, someone told me to look up Andujar hitting. So that's awesome. They said that he would swing for the fences. They would said he would swing for the fences, and then in his post game interviews, he would just say stuff like, uh, "I thought I was going to get it. Thought I was going to get it." But I don't know if there's any highlights of him swinging up there. Don't look like it. That sucks. All right, let's move on. Going to Amish country after this. Pretty excited. Getting a dog. And that's all I have to say about that. Book of the day, Steinbeck book. You guys like Steinbeck? No one talks about this one. I feel like they talk about Grapes of Wrath, East of Eden. Is East of Eden? A bunch of other ones. Tortilla Flat's a fun book. If anyone wants a quick, fun read, like back pocket, bring it anywhere, subway commute every morning. It's, uh, it's about this group of, it's about camaraderie and this group of friends in Monterey. All of Steinbeck stuff that takes place in Monterey is pretty good. Um, Salinas, California. I've been there. I used to film soccer there. Um, it's about this group of friends that just, uh, they're drunks and thieves and like, you know, irresputable people like Cannery Row. But uh, one of their leaders, the grandpa leaves them two houses. So now they have like a gang, uh, not a, like they have like a hangout to hang out, but one of the houses burns down. So then they all move in together and they go on adventures together and they help people and they hurt people. And then at the end it comes together in a real cool, uh, touching camaraderie friendship story. But hey, it's funny. It's fun. Mostly it's funny. And then at the end it's touching, but tortilla flat. I went through a, a bit. I haven't read all of Steinbeck stuff. I went through a big Steinbeck phase because so easy to read. So short and easy to read. And a lot of my Steinbeck books, because I told you I used to go to the Newtown, Connecticut book fair. And on the last day, you can just go in there. It's free. The second to last day, it's $5. Everything you can fit in this bag that they give you. After that's free. So any, any like Steinbeck, I would just grab. So most of my Steinbeck books don't have covers, don't have backs, are like broken in half. They're like damaged. Trying to see if I underlined anything in here, which is a scary game when the pages are so fucking old and frail to try and write on it. But I remember that I read this while I was in film school commuting to San Francisco and back on BART. Look at this page. Not good. There was a little... There was something I a little dashed. must have been a line I liked or something, but I can't find it now. All right, we'll do a little Q&A once I find this 
damn quote that may not even be worth it. God, the book's falling apart. No, looks like it wasn't even anything. Looks like I was just testing to see if my pen still had ink. Damn. Old Jimmy just faked me out. Old Jimmy was a punk, man. Here's a quote I underlined. It is astounding to find that the belly of every black and evil thing is as white as snow, and it is saddening to discover how the concealed parts of angels are leprous. I don't really know the context of that, but I'm guessing that uh, the evil people were scared, privileged. I don't know. Strong's in this book. Tortilla Flat. We'll pick it up. It's a pretty easy book to read. All Steinbeck's books is easy. Cool. All right. What's going on? Chat seems active. I didn't didn't follow along too much. Um, yeah, someone in Periscope said, isn't he Mice of Men also? Yeah, so like Mice of Men, Grapes of Wrath. Mice of Men's good too. Grapes of Wrath. Uh, those are the famous ones. But I mean, Sweet Thursday, Tortilla Flat, uh, The Pearl... <clears throat> cannery i like those more um the moon is down i like that one about uh uh war that was a really quick one and the wayward bus people really really like but they're not the popular ones my voice sounds much different now i got something in my throat you, whenever i have something in my throat like this i'm like the last one to realize it's usually my girlfriend or my sister or my mom like clear your throat you sound wrong <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> what else is going on chat Jimmy gummies and Tiger King today or what uh, Tiger King um, no gummies today because well maybe I don't know unless I don't think I have any I'm, go I'm going to New Jersey after the dog so probably no gummies Tiger King you can watch it it's, it's, it's like the first couple episodes are super interesting because the characters that they're introducing are wild and you're like these people exist this can't be real and then at the second half, they get into the whole who done it and, and who should be in jail and who shouldn't. And, they, you know, the, they all should be in jail. So I didn't really care about the ending at all because I was like, I don't like, I'm not going to choose a side for these people. They're all fucking suck. Look at this. I just put all the chats in front of me. Now I can read everything. What's up, John boy? You think you would ever fall in love with a tiny person? I don't know. I'm kind of in love, so hoping that uh, I don't fall out and then have to fall back in somewhere else. When are you getting your dog today? Uh, my mom's coming to pick us up in the city because my parents are getting a dog from the same same litter. Uh, and then we're going to drive. So maybe in like three, four hours. What name are your parents going for their dog? Cashel, which is an Irish Irish. Uh, Castle, Irish. So we're sticking with the Irish and the Scottish. McDougal and Cashel. Cash, Dukes. Um, sup, man? Much love from Amsterdam. That's cool. What's up? Michael Hugis. Huggis says, I think it would be awesome if you did systematic videos on racism in the MLB. Uh, yeah, go read up on... Um, Moses Fleetwood Walker. You know, Moses Fleetwood Walker was a catcher that um, he's the first professional black baseball player. Um, well, there's a guy before him, but no one knew he was black and he told everyone he was white so he could play. So he was the first professional black baseball player, but he didn't face the repercussions because people didn't know he was black. But Moses Fleetwood Walker for the Toledo Blue Hen Moses Fleetwood Toledo Mud Hens Toledo What do you play for? Toledo something. Anyway, Moses Walker was the first black professional baseball player. But Cap Anson one of the stars of the day said, there's no fucking way I'll ever play on the same field as that guy. And he was a star. And then um, 
And then the uh, the pitchers, because Fleetwood Walker was a catcher, the pitchers would intentionally cross him up. So they'd be like, yeah, uh, curveball, yes, and then just throw a fastball right at his face. Um, so, yeah, it's fucked up. It's crazy. Will this, show, will this show keep going when you're back in the office and have a morning dog walk poop to do? I think so. I'm going to try. I like doing this. Like I say at the beginning, this is, is more like, you know, someone got mad at me because I said it's for me, not for you guys. But what I mean when I say that is I'm not tailoring this to you. Um, it's just all my interests wrapped into one. And I've been doing videos on YouTube and videos on it, uh, social media since way before I had an audience. I spent like five years doing a video a week and no one watched. It's just like a creative itch that I need to scratch. So that's what this show has become for me. So I want to keep doing it, but um, we'll see if it's hard. I want to keep this set up and maybe do it in the morning here. And then I just need to get to the office by 10 o'clock for John Boy and Jake radio, or I can go to the office earlier, do it there and then stay. But that's a little more time at the office, less time here. So we'll see. Um, uh, Jimmy, I need to see Cole pitch in a Yankees uniform. Me too, man. That'd be cool. We got one game in spring training, so that's nice. John Boy looks like Gardner Minshew. Take it. I'll take it. More White Sox content. Uh, okay, I'll try. Go get Puig. Amsterdam, check it off the map. The map for the morning show would be crazy. People tune in from all over. It's awesome. It's hilarious seeing Shawnee try to heart. Who's Shawnee? Oh. Uh, he's a guy that's watching but actively hating. It's the weirdest part about it's the weirdest part about YouTube community, man. We don't we don't have it a lot on our on our channel, which is awesome. But if you go to like Joe Rogan's videos, it's nothing but people that watch the entire video and then talk shit about the entire video. It's so weird. It's like someone should write a paper on the YouTube commenters culture. It's like it's people that like they listen, but they think the only way to engage is to shit on it. It's very odd. Uh, our audience on YouTube is is awesome. Like it's weird. They're very, very supportive and nice and all that. Sometimes they hate anything that's not a breakdown, but the people that do come to other things are awesome. Um, don't forget being there. We talked about being there, right? Didn't I already talk about being there? You look like you're going to fall asleep. It's the morning show, man. Didn't even finish my coffee. Of course I'm tired. If I was, I'm not a morning person. Um, you need a cat. Oof. Fuck that. I get a cat. I'm allergic to cats. All right. I think I'm done. This is the last thing I'm doing for the day. So I can hang out for a while if you guys want to talk or not. But all the negative people just need to watch Cole Tucker talking baseball to make you feel better. Yeah, if you're ever having a bad day, go listen to Cole Tucker. Um, want to know what I'm excited about? Next week, we are interviewing the director of the new uh, 30 for 30 on Sammy Sosa and Mark McGuire and the home run trace chase. And they gave us a screener to watch. And that is a perk of having a popular baseball show. I'm so excited for that. Uh, the Cole Pucker Todd was really fun. It was. What breed of dog are you getting? Wheaton Terrier. Soft-coated Wheaton Terrier. His name is going to be MacDougal. Call him Mac. Call him Dugs. Train the shit out of him. Just got here and now you're gone. How's life been, John? I'm not gone yet. I'm not gone. Life's been good, man. Uh, life's been good. Business is, is, is striving despite having no baseball. We just had our most engaged, viewed month um, in the history of the channel. And there's not even baseball. And CPMs are down. And we have uh, some things in the work. 
I think we just uh, signed off on a new show that I'm really excited to to bring. It's a whole new perspective in the baseball world. So we're excited about that. Really excited about that. Um, you know, we just had Ian Happ on a show for all Cubs fans. He'll be he'll be Monday's episode. We got the 30 for 30 director lined up. We got a big old meeting next week. Very exciting. Got invited to a meeting that we're very excited about. I think I told you guys about the NBC Bay Area thing that I kind of auditioned for. There's a lot going on. It's crazy to keep track of. I try to call my dad and give him updates of like the back end of the business. And it's like every day there's five moving parts. So that's crazy. But other than that, it's been good. Yesterday was crazy. Yesterday I was on, I recorded eight broadcasts because today we're, we're not doing anything. So yesterday was an output day. Uh, Banger Maine, good morning in Facebook. That's cool. There's the threes a crowd rabbit hole I went down because of your clip took a few hours of my work day. Threes a crowd. We'll definitely have to do more threes a crowd. We're, we're going to start going to the office, at least Jake, because now we can go to the office next week. At least Jake, myself, and producer BBD. Uh, we can't do a full office, but we're going to start going. So I'm hoping that for like watching baseball, watching baggage, watching whatever, we can start doing them in the same room again because it's so much quicker and easier. You should see the, the setup we have to record those in two separate rooms. It's nuts. And uh, the editing that Zach has to do to put it together. We send him two video feeds and four audio feeds to sync everything up. It's nuts. You think baseball will come back? I don't know, man. The owners are going to just have to lose. Like, they're just going to have to lose. The players are offering so much. Get it to 82 games. The players have offered expanded playoffs next season. The players have, have offered being mic'd up all the time. They've offered ways to enhance the broadcast. They've offered, you know, more jewel games and more, you know, big event games like the Iowa game and, and the London games to drum up because those make money. The players have actually been really smart in offering legit things. You know, they asked for 114 games. I'm sure the players will settle at 82 and they're offering a lot extra to try and be like, here, this is what you get. This is what you get. They're negotiating in good faith. And the owners, you know, Tony Clark told the players, if we can make you play a 60 game season. And if you don't, it's breach of contract. It's like, what good does that fucking do? They're trying to work with you so hard. The players are trying to give you perks and extras, and the owners just want to win. I've never seen the owners lose the PR battle as bad as they are. They control the media. They control everything, and they're still losing this PR battle because they're just, it's, it's, and you know, for a while I was neutral, and now it's like, what are you doing, owners? What are you doing, Manfred? Just stubborn for stubborn's sake. It's nuts. And I know that they will lose money, but like the players are giving ways to not lose money and the players should not take the hit of the money lost when the players don't make take the gain on the money earned. It's just common fucking sense. Owners have made crazy money. Revenue's gone up the last five years while salaries stay exactly the same. So the players have not seen any part of that gained revenue. Now you have one down year, and you want the players to see a big part of the down revenue? It makes no sense. It's so fucking common sense. It's so frustrating. I've never seen the owners lose the PR battle. People always take the owner's side. They always want to call the players greedy. You get paid for playing a stupid game as if the game that they play and the reason that they play it makes it worth what it is. You get paid what you're worth. We all fucking love the sport, so we tune in, and there's a lot of money in that. And these are the best of the best. Only, what, 20,000 players or something like that? It's nuts. It's nuts. So, owners got a cave. Only way this happens is if the owners take a loss. The union's been great. Um, next time Dale Scott's on, can you ask him? Ask him what? 
Patty says, I don't understand how baseball revenue keeps going up, but ratings keep going down. I don't think ratings keep going down. I mean, the whole baseball's dying is is drummed up way harder than it is. I, I don't think ratings are going down. I think ratings are going up. You also have to remember, you know, there's 18 football games. There's 162 baseball games. Um. There's 162 baseball games and fans go to all of them. You know what I mean? If you're a New York Giants fan, there's eight times where you can go spend money at the stadium and and they can earn revenue off you. So like maybe attendance is higher because there's only eight games, but there's 81 games for baseball. Uh, all, uh, you know, people try to hype up the baseball's dying, but I believe TV ratings went up in a lot of markets. I know like the Rays have great TV ratings and all that. So it's not, it, baseball was in the, before, before Corona, baseball was in a good spot. They're finally connecting to the younger market. They were like doing correct things. They were m- moving forwards. They didn't shut us down. They're not shutting other internet places down. They're trying to work with us. Like, you know, Players, the young, young talent's awesome. Players were finally speaking out. Um, and then this sucks, and now the owners and the players suck, so it all sucks. It's crazy. Am I the only one who prefers to listen to baseball on the radio? I mean, you don't like watching it at all? You do the radio call while watching, but I don't think, uh, yeah. They say baseball is dying because the younger generation doesn't like it much. Yeah, MLB abandoned the youth for a decade. They're getting better at that. I'm also, um, I'm also, like, I don't need, I don't need kids watching regular season baseball games. I don't, I don't think the sport needs it either. They should invest in youth programs to have kids play baseball at a younger age in an enjoyable fashion. They should try and uh, offer avenues that aren't showcases and AAU tournaments and actual like town teams that you can take pride in, have fun and play with your friends. And and it's a billion dollar industry youth baseball now, and it shouldn't be. So get kids playing baseball, having fun. They can watch highlights on any social media app they use um, and watch highlights and gain heroes and their favorite players. And then they can try to play it and then they'll fail. And then when they turn 23 years old and they're out of college and they have a nine to five and they want to get home at night and turn off their brain. Bam. Baseball's there for them. Seven to 10 every night. That's the audience you're going to get. You're not going to get a 14 year old kid watching. I mean, I I was one of those 14 year old kids, but I think I'm rare where you watch like 150 games. Shouldn't even try. Make kids love the sport of baseball. Then they'll become fans of the game of, of the, the, the entertainment of the show. You know, make them love playing, then they'll like watching. That would be my strategy. I I don't know. Maybe that's dumb. I have no say in the matter, but that's what I would do. Cool. All right. I think I'm going to bow out, play some Langhorn Slam. I'll see you guys on Monday. I should have a puppy by then. I will have a puppy by then. Maybe I'll ha- hold him. But I don't know. I trained this fucker. He's a little jerk right now, probably you know, pissing shit everywhere. But oh, what do what happened? What happened? The video, the music I was gonna play went away. Do 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 do. Here it is. All right. See ya. Have a good weekend. Enjoy yourself. Goodbye. Thanks for hanging out with me. I really appreciate it. It's been fun. 